This week on Wealth Track, a television exclusive with a great investor specializing in small treasures. Small cap fund pioneer Chuck Royce on where he is finding quality companies under the radar is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. If you're interested, just go to WealthTrack.com for more information. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. Here's where we stand. Low short-term interest rates as far as the eye can see. Weeks of improved economic news. One of the best New Year market performances in years. More professional investors jumping on the bullish bandwagon. It should be enough to turn the head of even the most jaded investor, right? Wrong. As a group, individual investors are not biting yet. If you look at figures from the Investment Company Institute, net flows into domestic stock funds, while better than the billions that were moving in the opposite direction recently, are barely positive or slightly negative foreign stock funds have seen some small improvement. But the investment flow is still overwhelmingly in favor of bonds, with taxable and municipal bond funds receiving billions of dollars in new cash. That is a source of much frustration for many recent WealthTrack guests who run stock-focused mutual funds and believe stocks are more attractive than they have been in years. Today's great investor and WealthTrack exclusive is no exception. He is Charles Chuck Royce, founder, portfolio manager, and co-chief investment officer at the Royce Funds, where he pioneered small cap stock investing with his flagship Royce Pennsylvania Mutual Fund 40 years ago. There are now about 30 Royce Funds, and Chuck either runs, co-manages, or assists on more than a third of them. Contrary to most other recent WealthTrack guests who have been focusing on the opportunities they see in dominant blue-chip global companies, Royce's research convinces him that high-quality, small-cap stocks are where the best values lie. But he also realizes that his strategy is a hard sell. The volatility that has scared investors away from stocks is even more pronounced in small-caps. I began the interview by asking Royce why he feels so strongly that individual investors should not give up on stocks. Well, I think it's the big, the big one out there. It's, it's, we know that investors are just had a miserable experience for the last one year, five years, 10 years, maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, everything has gone wrong. In their not portfolio. in your funds. I'm going to tell you that. Not in the in, well, in we've, your funds. Well, we've done fine. Small cap's done very well. Right. We've had some, some great moments. But in general, the right. overall equity experience has been miserable. It's been tough. It's been it's been flat, it's been almost no return. And as an investor, as an advisor, ultimately you have to face this question, why should I keep on going? Why shouldn't I give up? Why shouldn't I? Unfortunately, the, the real question then is ultimately, what do I do? And the what you do is there are not other great alternatives at all. We all know in fixed income, they're not great alternatives. Uh, although people, because they're inclined to drive with a rear view mirror, look at the returns on fixed income, especially corporate bonds and especially government bonds, and they've been fabulous. Right. Absolutely fabulous. The, you know, if you just put a couple bucks into treasury bills 30 years ago, you would have done very well. Now, we all know that's not gonna continue. We all know that in the setting we're in today with rates so low, the opposite is going to take place. So let me stop you there, because if I had talked to you probably a year ago, which I did, 
um, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, mm -hmm. whatever it is, I, I might have heard the same argument at least five years ago. Don't buy U.S. Treasuries. You know, you know, r rates are historically low. You're not going to get the kind of returns. And the equity guys were wrong. Yeah. So, so why are they? Why aren't you going to be proven wrong again this time? What's changed? Well, of course, I can't give you. You know, I can't, I can't give you the exact how the future is going to unfold. Right. But I think that there is strong historic. Uh, logic to how returns take place over time that gives you a probability that there are much better returns coming up in the next five and ten years. Now that doesn't tell you what this year is going to be about or the next couple of years, but I do believe it's very strong and, and completely sufficient in my judgment to dedicate yourself to using equities. But the real reason to use equities is that you can put together a portfolio of very good companies for at book value, one and a half times book value, maybe two times book value, that have returns on equity, 15%, 20%, which gives you as an owner of that security, as a partial owner of that company, gives you a 10 or 12% compounding machine. And that compounding machine must give you a good return over very long periods of time. So long periods of time being, because you think in three to five year we horizons think three at to least. Five, yes. Right. So what's a very long period of time? Because most of us are looking at you and saying, Chuck, I'm sorry, I don't have a long period of time. I'm not willing to wait. Yeah. So well, that that's a great. I mean, that is the sort of sixty-four dollar question for the individual investor, a sixty-nine year old who's just uh, entered into retirement and is completely, uh, completely discouraged. Right. And what should they do? Even that person should be overweighted with equities because the other kinds of things that they will be tempted to do, fixed income one, but these other kind of bizarre products that are out there. Like right? the alternative investment type stuff? That's well, for all sorts of things that are being sold to individual investors you know, timber and all sorts of things, I just do not believe can give you the kind of extraordinary types of returns you get by owning a company. A company is a dynamic compounder of, of wealth. It can make the adjustments to inflation, to deflation, to recession, to prosperity. It can make those adjustments for you. Uh, in a way that allows the return on equity to continue. And the return on equity lets you compound your money, but at some point, if the stock doesn't go up, then these companies go private or shrink their capitalization, et cetera. The, the, the small cap companies. In the small cap, mm -hmm. well, in, the, in almost any size capitalization. These comments are all about why equities are the best place to be. So let me ask you about market volatility, and, and you did a chart of the Russell 2000 in uh, the, the looking back over the, like the last I don't know, 10, 20 years. And the, the chart of the Russell 2000 shows how much the volatility, the up and down dramatic swings uh, have occurred uh, and how much more volatility there is in the market. So is that something that we just have to get used to in this headline-driven market? or? Do you think that that's going to change as well? I think the daily volatility has increased dramatically. That is not a positive from an investor standpoint. It, it definitely is, is a very unnerving phenomena for investors of any sort. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say approximately daily volatility has tripled in the last five to 10 years, you know, from a base of the early part of the decade to currently. And just why, why do you think it has I think a whole bunch of reasons, um, ranging, ranging from the ETFs being part of uh, the, the sort of fabric of, of what's available. So people to, trading in and out of ETFs constantly, yes, therefore there's... Uh, the demise of the specialist system, uh, which has completely disappeared. The ability of, of using all sorts of uh, electronic transactions to interface with the market. 
uh, frequent trading. High frequency trading, right. Uh, the types of systems. Um, I think they have created much higher daily volatility. And there's no question that has contributed to people's anxiety. Um, in the long run, I don't think daily volatility is going to interrupt the long-term returns, but it sure doesn't feel good. Do we have evidence yet that it is not affecting long-term returns? For instance, when you go about your business of, of analyzing individual stocks and you're looking at how those stocks behave over the three to five year periods or whatever, are, are you noticing any difference in what kind of returns that you can expect? Well, I do think that that's a great question because uh, you know we're looking every day at, at the expected returns and we do have expected returns in our mind. We, we want to gather a portfolio that could generate 12, 15% compounding returns as a sort of target. I'm not sure that the daily volatility will impact that, but I couldn't tell you that it won't either. Now, the other thing we've noticed, it, it actually monthly volatility is about the same. As it was? Uh, five years ago or whatever. Oh. So yes, you're getting much more daily volatility, but the monthly return patterns are about the same. So I don't think it's going to dramatically affect long-term returns. Let's talk about the, the, the Royce funds and, and, and the fact that, that you are called a value manager, but you told me the last time I interviewed you a year ago that basically you would prefer to be called a risk manager and that you look at risk of an individual company before you look at uh, the return that you expect from that company. So tell us how you are doing that and if you've had to do anything different in this era of much higher market volatility. The idea of risk and being a risk manager is a critical one. Uh, the word value has become a cliche. You know, who isn't a value manager? So we have kind of backed off from that word. Of course, we think we're a value manager, but, but in fact, from an operating standpoint, we believe we're a risk manager. We want to look at the risk of the portfolio as a whole. We want to look at the risk of the enterprise we're looking at. We want to look at their strategy risk. We want to understand their business model and how it all plays out in their niche. We want to look at the balance sheet. If we had to pick any one of those things, it would be balance sheet risk. We want to take away that as the incremental kind of wild card. So we want to have very strong balance sheets. And we, all of our portfolios have a balance sheet that are much stronger than average. And why is a strong balance sheet so important at this particular point in time? These are younger companies. They're smaller companies. They're by definition more fragile. And you don't want to compound the exogenous kinds of activities that go on in their world with balance sheet risk. If you put the two together, it's a firecracker. So quality is a theme right now at well, Royce Quality Fines. has always, the balance sheet quality has always been a factor. More recently, we're emphasizing very high quality companies, those that have extraordinary returns on investment as a way of navigating this sort of complicated economy, macro background, uh, unknown, where are we in the economic cycle, unknown. Uh, so we need very high quality companies. That has become a theme starting several years ago uh, and will continue for a while. Has that made a difference in the stock performance? Um, I couldn't look you in the eye and say it's made a big difference so far, but it's begun to make a difference starting in the second half of last year, and I believe this year also. Another theme uh, of Royce over the last several years has been focusing on, on international global exposure, global businesses. So given especially what's happened in Europe over the last couple of years, uh, was that the right emphasis? Does that emphasis still work? 
Yeah, we, we absolutely believe that the world, the global phenomena is very real. It is certainly kind of over promoted maybe as a, as a way to deliver high returns, but as a phenomena, it is very real. And most of our domestic companies who are high quality are in fact global enterprises. We have many companies that receive 50% plus of their revenues overseas. It could be any place. It could be exporting, it could be sourcing uh, costs, it could be a variety of ways. But the global thing is very real and it's very important to small companies. Uh, sort of, that's counterintuitive, but it, it is extremely important for small companies. Why? Well, because small companies aren't so small. The small companies for us would be a billion or two billion dollar company that- Revenues. Rev well, in market cap, market but they cap. might have one or two, same amount of sales. Um, and those sales would be sourced around the world. So let's talk about the small company stocks. They are more volatile than large cap stocks. Absolutely. And in, a, in an era where people are running away from volatility, mm -hmm. that would tell me that it's a harder sell as, a, as an asset class. Right. The volatility is historic. We, there's small cap stocks have always had higher volatility. They had volatility, higher volatility to this day. Given the volatility that small cap stocks have historically had, and certainly that they've had in the period the last several years, what does a small cap stock exposure do in my portfolio? Why should I bother with sure. small cap stocks? That's a great question. You should expect higher returns. So if you don't expect higher returns, you shouldn't use small cap stocks. And you should expect higher returns with less correlation to your overall portfolio. So ideally, you're gonna get higher returns with less correlation. Now, we've gone through a phase where everything appeared to be highly correlated. Highly everything goes up, this whole risk on, risk off, new word, um, means is referring to correlations. And it's an unfortunate phenomena that is partially true. I mean, we all sense that markets go all up together and all down together. I do not think that's the condition forever. And why don't you think that's going to be the condition I, I forever? I think it's just an unnatural, um, it's an unnatural combination of things that have come together um, with all the stresses going on in, from a headline standpoint. We have had, you know, you can't avoid the headlines and, and this whole world of what's, you know, where is the bomb going off uh, has been, you know, has, has driven market sensitivity to a new high. Uh, we all know volatility has gone higher. Well, this whole correlation has gone higher. I do not believe that's a permanent condition. I absolutely do not. I know you don't like to talk about individual stocks, but I'm, I'm curious about your how you apply your risk management to, to some companies. And, and if there are companies that are emblematic of, of the Royce approach. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we talked about a, a money management company in Asia, the Value Partners, the last time you were on, and also the Toronto Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. uh, which got some play uh, yes. a year ago as well. Sure, well, we always looking at money management companies. The investment world is an exciting and, and I think a positive world. So Still? We, we look at investment companies, absolutely especially those that have sort of longer term characteristics. Um, more recently in the last year or so, we've taken a position in a uh, UK company called Ashmore, which manages uh, emerging market debt and has a wonderful record and a wonderful reputation and has more recently bought a emerging market equity manager. Uh, we are Why? I mean, what, what is it about money management firms that you think are so compelling. Sure. Well, they, they certainly beat banks in terms of, <laughs> of, you know, understanding. You can understand what the manager is doing. You know, to contrast that with banks, it's virtually impossible to understand what a bank, what's going on in the asset or liability side of the balance sheet of, of a bank at any time. 
Um, so even, even in very good times, you, you really cannot do that kind of analysis as an investor. So we prefer uh, kinds of financial service companies that don't have that, that asset liability complication, which money managers do not. Money managers get paid you know, frequently. They get paid quarterly. There's not a receivable problem. Uh, they don't have inventories. Uh, they have relatively high margins. They're simpler businesses. So we, we've always looked at them, and we will have some in our portfolios at all times. Misconceptions about small cap stocks. What don't we know that there we should know? There are plenty. Everybody thinks small caps are growth companies or small and, you know, about teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. So people do not grasp intuitively or naturally that there are extremely high quality, strong companies that grow and prosper in a, in a very normal way. People don't think that, or they think that it's all about M&A. Now, that, that, a, that a small company is going to be taken over, yeah. that that's where and you get your return from. And of course that happens, and that is a, a, that's a very strong part of what goes on, but it's a two-way street. Small companies acquire their competitors, they acquire their smaller companies. So M&A is a constant activity in the small comp world in a positive way. It goes on in good times, in good times or when stock prices are very high, you might the stock price itself might be part of the transaction. Uh, in lesser times, it would be cash. But there is not a single week that goes by that we don't have an M&A transaction somewhere in our portfolio. How big an issue is liquidity or illiquidity in the small cap it's, stock it's space? Kind of, uh, it's an interesting question, but it's one that ultimately we buy when things are illiquid. We, we are buyers into that uh, Ill illiquidity moment. We expect that the company as it prospers to generate more liquidity. So over time, we will be buyers when it's illiquid and sellers when it's highly liquid. We're gonna take advantage of the illiquidity. Illiquidity is another risk factor and we wanna be compensated for it. Dividends, why are dividends a theme as well? at Royce, particularly now? Dividends are a wonderful marker of quality. It is a, the strongest attribute of quality. Dividends in the small cap space, though, are often small, two or three percent. I personally believe that the market does not price those small dividends into sort of the pricing model of a company. So you get those small dividends, two and three percent, I believe, for free. I cannot prove that, uh, but it is my absolute impression over time that those two and three percent smaller dividends add up enormously, especially in a low return environment, in a in a 6% rate environment, in an 8% environment, 2% is 25% of your return. So it is a very important part of what we do. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, something that we should all own some of, and we cannot, you cannot recommend your own funds. I think a dividend paying a company uh, involved in a, um, you know, in a, in a non-asset intensive industry, uh, a company that we like in the financial world would be Lazard. Uh, Lazard is kind of a mid-size company, uh, but it, has, it participates in M&A, obviously. They have a very strong money management division that we think are very well positioned, and it sells at a very reasonable price. And if you were to pick a favorite child among your about 30 funds at the Royce uh, Mutual Fund Company, uh, what, which fund do you think is going to do the best in 2012? I think Royce 100, which is a fund that concentrates on high quality small cap companies, limited portfolio, 100 stocks. Um, I think that's going to do the best. Chuck Royce, what a pleasure to have you on Wealth Track. Thank you Great. so much for joining us. Thank you. 
At the conclusion of every wealth track, we try to leave you with one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point picks up on a very important point that Chuck Royce made in his interview. So this week's action point is recognize the value of dividends. As Chuck said, dividends are wonderful markers of a company's quality. In fact, they can be the strongest marker. They show management is acting in the interest of shareholders by sharing the rewards of the business with them. And dividends are incredibly valuable in a low return environment. A 2% dividend can make up 25% of an 8% return. And as Chuck pointed out, you can find them in small cap stocks as well as larger ones. I hope you can join us next week. We're going to tackle asset allocation. What's the right mix for your portfolio with Morgan Stanley's chief investment strategist, David Darst, who is also a noted master of the art of asset allocation. To see this interview again or subscribe to see WealthTrack guests ahead of the pack, please go to our website, WealthTrack.com. Thank you so much for watching and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Research Affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market.